Good afternoon or good evening or good early afternoon, depending on where you are in the country or around the world where you're watching from. Uh, welcome to AP Live Daily Review. Uh, you are now, if you're going to allow me to mix my metaphors, which you have to allow because you're there and I'm here, we are now into the funnel as we make that turn for home, all of us, right? Whether you're digital, uh, electronic, in person, uh, paper in person, at home, at school, wherever you're taking it. We're up against it now. You've come uh, into the second week with us, uh, two more episodes to go. We've got so much to introduce today on ideas, building off of what Dr. Webb's uh, great episode of yesterday was on the DBQ. Let's move into LEQ performance on a few things. Complexity, what is that all about in the LEQ? How do you deal with that? How do you grapple? How do you get there and make it fit? Um, rules of evidence for LEQ. How do you actually use your evidence as skill development to advance your point and make your case? What am I going to do, you're asking? Well, we are going to try to show you what to do as we bring it forward and try to bring it home all the way across for AP Live Daily Review episode, uh, what are we on now? Six, I believe it is. Episode six, period seven dash A. Six of eight coming along on our way. I'm Bill Pulaski from Stillman Valley High School in Northern Illinois. So glad to have you along with us today. And so the question is, what are we going to look at today to start? To begin with, what will we learn? What are we going to get into? Where are we going to be? Where are we going to go? We're gonna to start tonight's session with period seven, what we call 7A. Dr. Webb and I made a decision right away, a battlefield decision putting us together that period seven is so immense between what? Two world wars, the great depression, economic recovery, some imperialism, a progressive era, and if you can't forget the roaring 20s, we made a decision that this would be the one period we would slice over two episodes. So I'm taking you through the first half today, which is 1890 to 1929. We will look in this process at an exam component, short answer exam, exam component, specifically on image-based prompts. Uh, how do you tackle them? What are you looking for? What are you being tasked and asked to do with them? What are your approaches and strategies? And then skills development. As I've talked about rules of evidence, how do you use your evidence? Uh, Dr. Webb was talking so, did an excellent job of talking DBQ the other day. She's handing the baton off to me to talk LEQ and rules of evidence, which are the same but different, different but the same, but hopefully a lot of compounding reinforcement there for you. And then we'll explore the exam component of complexity, that mystery complexity point, the sixth point for us, not the uh, seventh point. That's a DBQ thing there. So again, as always, your feedback has been uber helpful to us, super, super helpful for ha having us tailor and craft and shape and sharpen and hone our business and practice to make sure we're giving you both what you want and what you're not quite sure you want, but we know you ought to want. And that's our content process sweet spot that we're trying to balance so much for you. Please keep the feedback coming. And along with that, as proof that we're addressing a few things, we do have uh, some items here that we want to look at and revolving questions you've all asked. Um, AP Classroom is locked for me. We've had this question a couple of times and you can't get in. So what should you do about, should you do about that? This is where you need to uh, talk to your classroom teacher. Your classroom teacher, because it is his classroom you are in uh, for the College Board's purposes on uh, collegeboard.com, they have to unlock those uh, to get you in the personal progress checks and then get you into the AP, AP Classroom daily instruction videos as well. So that's on their end. So go to your instructor about that and have them unlock those features for you. And then your class, you and your classmates will be able to get in. Short answer questions. Do you have to answer A, B, and C in one big paragraph? The answer is no, not in the least. In fact, I uh, encourage my students as the, the person who out there who asked, I encourage them to sort of part do A, thing one, B, thing two, C, thing three, even label them as such. Even if you label it, for instance, as part B, but you're actually answering part of part A in there, you will not be penalized for that. The reader's job is to look for whether or not you've met the requirements of the tasks, not whether or not you did A and A, B and B, and C inside the spot of C. So for your own purposes, don't feel any hesitation about organizing your SAQ that way. How badly do errors of names and dates hurt my essay? Well, I'm going to give you an example of that tonight. You're going to see at least one example. Um, you've been craving or really requesting student work. I've got some student work for you tonight versus stuff that I've made up. I figure it's a fair fight. And my own students say the same thing. Yeah, Pulaski, that's great. That's a really great example. You wrote it. You're teaching the class. You ought to do it decently. So I'm going to show you what adolescents have done, at least for a couple of real exemplars here of actual student work for the exam. Names and dates. The rubric, as we've discussed, is only discussed in the affirmative about things you do to earn points. So if you do make mistakes on dates or names, yet still do the requisite thing to earn things to earn your points, you earn your points. And remember, first draft, pressure situation, time constraint. If you're talking about Lyndon Johnson and you accidentally label him as Andrew Johnson, 
That's not the end of the world, unless you're going to make the argument that Andrew Johnson was this guy who was impeached in the 1960s for his failure to adequately address the reconstruction during the Vietnam War, which clearly means you're thinking you're talking about the wrong guy. So it's, uh, it's going to be what it'll be in that sense. Can you show us more about sourcing LEQ and DBQ? That is today. That's where we're going. So ask and you shall receive. You are wise beyond your years to want that. Should documents be laid out by title, number of content or content? Really depends. I gave my rationale the other day for why I believe that using parenthetical citation is useful for you to sort of, in an actuarial sense, keep track of what you're using because you know there are requirements to use three for uh, happy or hip analysis, three for description, or six for uh, advancing your argument. If you can't keep track of how you used it, uh, that's going to hurt you. In any event, the real issue is are you showing how or telling what with your work? That's still the most important thing. Does your essay need to be done as well as those in the videos? Well, sort of. We're showing you exemplars of uh, today. I'm going to show you exemplars of things that earn points and things that don't. Hopefully, this is for SAQ so you can see the difference because the difference is not much, but it's significant. So um, it's like the question, how long should it be? My kids always ask me, how long should my essay be? Long enough to get your point across. There is no hard and fast rule there. Do you get a copy of all the rubrics on the exam? A fair question to be asked. No, but yes. Remember the bullet points that lay out the directions for the long essay question, the DBQ, implicitly have those rubric points tucked into them. So if you're ever wondering, what am I supposed to do? Go back and reread the directions. It'll sort of uh, jog your memory or trigger your mind on the things that you need to do to compile your points in that sense. Um, do you have scratch paste for pre-writing? For, for pre Yes and yes, both digital and paper. This is why you need to bring uh, pens and pencils with you to the exam, even if you're a digital tester. You cannot bring your own paper, but the proctors will provide you with scratch paper to write to jot down your ideas on and kind of structure what you're trying to do. And as for those of you taking the in-person paper exam, the booklet itself, you can write all over the scratch paper, the documents, even the pink booklet that you're writing in, you can use some of that to rough your ideas out. So the answer is definitely yes. Digital people bring something to write with because you have that option. Can you use abbreviations? This is a stylistic thing, but I think it's important. I've always coached my kids to use the proper noun first rule. In other words, give the, give the full name of the thing you're going to abbreviate followed immediately by the abbreviation. So for instance, if we were doing a period, I don't know, period three kind of thing. As Jefferson says in the Declaration of Independence, D of I, and then go on, or as countered by the Articles of Confederation, AOC, which was this really weak document, I think that's the good way to do it. And then you can use that parenthetical one the rest of the way through because you've identified it once the first time. That being said, avoid text talk, okay? This is not some sort of conversational fluidity thing between you and the reader. You know, BTW, for, by the way, I am over, in my opinion, don't, don't go there. Don't do that. You are still attempting to craft an essay, even though it might be a first draft in a pressure situation. It's not that much, uh, it's not that kind of thing you're trying to do. What if your teacher taught you to do things differently than in the videos? Fair question, super question. All we're doing is showing you strategies that might maybe help you in certain ways. And we're throwing stuff at the wall to see if something sticks for you. If you have things already thrown at the wall that are stuck, by all means, go with them. Or if you're doing the points, as I would say, dance with the gal that brung you. In other words, you do you. If the things you're doing, tried and true methods from your educator have worked, we're simply giving you angles that we use that have worked for us. And we have no monopoly on wisdom. There's more than one way. There's more than a dozen ways to do so much of what's been done here. If you're actually making progress and earning your points, feel free to do things that are your most in your comfort zone. Exam formats. You hate seeing this slide, so I will zip through it, but it's here. So those of you who want to see it, replay it again to see it, you can see it. The differences between the exams and focus on yours. Find it again because you'll need to know. I'm hearing a big cheer now from all the people that want to see that slide anymore, but for our new arrivers, that's important for you to look at on your own. Let's get right into content, shall we? Period 7a begins with imperialism. And so the forms it, take or it took are important for you to understand. There's a variety of ways through which this notion of imperialism, of denying people peoples their own sovereignty, the right to make their own political decisions and right to their own self-rule. There's numerous ways that it took place, both in world history and for the American component. One could be outright annexation, you know, see Oregon, see Texas, see California. One way could be colonialism, you know, see the Philippines, see Puerto Rico, um, see the US Virgin Islands for, for a while, even Hawaii for a certain extent of time. One could be direct occupation without annexation or out direct rule, see places like Nicaragua, Cuba, Guatemala, El Salvador, all throughout the whole 1900 through 1930s in many ways, where we send in the Marines, you know, classic gunboat diplomacy. And then, of course, informal, 
with the threat of manipulation or, or intervention, you know, we park a park a battleship off the coast to get your attention, or certain amounts of economic and political control through uh, corporate or uh, trade powers of the United States. What are the motivations uh, for in the in the groundwork behind imperialism? Two mnemonic devices that have always, I've coached up my kids to use them. Uh, the six Ds is a hundred years old. I didn't invent that. The six Ps I have used that I sort of created on my own a variation. Whichever one works for you. What drove imperialism? Destiny, the expansion on the argument manifest destiny to sort of a global scale. Darwinism, social Darwinism applied to nations being that, you know, the strong have to survive and flourish. And in so doing, if they have to dominate the weakest part of that process, well, that's just the way it goes. Defense, the argument like the board game risk, if other great powers are engaging in these sort of global actions and the United States is not, relative to those powers will get weaker, even if we stay the same as we are, because they'll get stronger through colonization and conquest. So maybe in sort of a keeping up in the Joneses way, we need to be a part of this imperial game if we're going to maintain our stature as one of the great powers and not become marginalized. Dollars, there might be trade and markets out there. Democracy, um, the equivalent of giving an unruly child their medicine in a paternalistic sense, we're going to give these nations democracy because it's good for them, even if they don't know it's good for them. And give, we're going to give it to them by forcing it upon them, even if we have to, bringing light to that darkness of that whole white man's burden argument. And then as well, uh, the deity, you know, doing this in the name of white Christian civilization. Six Ps, same thing, just different letters for whichever one you know, sticks in your head. Profits, money to be made, patriotism, population, you know, we're expanding our economy, um, after the, after the closing of the frontier, politics, paternalism, and piety, again, religious motives. The influence of the Turner thesis here cannot be overstated. Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, argument on the closing of the frontier and the safety valve theory in uh, 1890, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, argued that with the closing of the frontier, America lost this excess space for economic development, but also population absorption that was going to create internal crises for the country because we no longer had an outlet for the vast energies of this coiled spring that was the America. This theory wound up actually not really being true, but like a lot of things, for about 100 years, Americans thought it was true. And so that's why it's important because it influences our thinking over a century on who we are and who we've been. Of course, the criticisms of imperialism come from the anti-imperialist league, the likes of Andrew Carnegie, uh, William Graham Sumner, Mark Twain, um, uh, William James Bryan, arguing that for a nation that threw off colonial yoke of rule by Britain to then colonize others is the height of hypocrisy. And it goes against everything the Declaration of Independence and American political thought has ever stood for. As for the Spanish-American War itself, my favorite line, you've seen it now in what, three of my four episodes, wars do not always solve old problems, sometimes they create new ones, and this is a classic case of this. So concern yourself with the Spanish-American War with causes and consequences. The Cuban Revolution of the uh, last 30 years of the 19th century was a movement like all the uh, Caribbean and South American movements, sort of in some ways inspired by the American Revolution, but more driven by the things that all people want that are yearning to breathe free, uh, rejection of imperialist colonial rule from afar. Yellow journalism or jingoism, sort of sensationalized, ultra-nationalist uh, periodical news, newspaper circulation generated a lot of interest in what was going on in this Cuban Revolution. And of course, the explosion, mo and most likely accidental, the explosion of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor um, provides this sort of a uh, mistaken reason for going to war that Americans at the time thought uh, the Spanish were behind this explosion forces the issue and limits their uh, McKinley's diplomatic maneuverability. This war has two campaigns, two fronts, one in the Philippines, which the United States dispatches with Spanish forces rather quickly, and then has, this, has to have this discussion about do we want a front porch to Asia and the lucrative trading markets that the Philippines would bring, and then of course the Cuba campaign, which the war is initially uh, instigated by. Proof of the dilemmas of this struggle would be in both the Platt and Teller Amendments, whereas in the Teller Amendment, the United States, through reasons of idealism, proclaims a war fought in Cuba, the United States seeks no territorial advancement out of that conflict. A couple of years later, after having thought about it, though, the Congress passes the Platt Amendment, which stipulates that Cuba, while going to be independent, can make can sign and grant no international agreements or treaties without prior U.S. approval. So Cuba is going to have that same kind of freedom that you have in your house. You are totally free to do whatever you want, as long as mom and dad say so first. Now, you know and I know that isn't exactly what freedom is. And so the Cubans understandably generate a rather anti-American attitude based on this as the United States as its unwelcome big brother from the North that will only let them do and not do certain things. 
As for the Philippine-American War, this is even more complicated as the United States engages in a, uh, a nasty little conflict in the Philippines where atrocities are committed on both sides as Philippine insurg Filipino insurgents whom were dissatisfied with Spanish rule are equally dissatisfied with the idea of being under an American master as opposed to a Spanish one. Um, exhibiting in many ways the limitations of a lowercase d, lowercase r, democratic republic trying to extend into a colonial empire. Open door policy on trade, which had met limited success, success at best as we try to crack open um, European spheres of influence in China, all the while trying to use the Roosevelt, Roosevelt corollary to create our own sphere of influence in the Caribbean since the corollary says that chronic wrongdoing by Latin American nations would require intervention by specifically the United States to organize their affairs so that Europeans wouldn't show up. And of course, the separation of Panama from Colombia, which is probably Frank or Teddy Roosevelt's most blatant and uh, aggressive moves in terms of exercising American muscle for an imperial cause in order to establish and create the Panama Canal on American terms, which in an engineering sense is one of the wonders of the modern world. The Great White Fleet, of course, representing this projection of American influence around the world, the ability to have a blue water or deep ocean navy to project power on a global basis, which is what all great imperial powers would need as a re requisite. Not so much a large army as, as a large navy for that global footprint. So let's practice a little if we could. Let's see a few things here. How are you gonna marry content to argument? Based on your request, do you wanna see these kinds of things more? You've gotta do it fast. You got 15 minutes in the DBQ and that can't be all documents. You know that you've gotta uh, bring your own information to the party and you've got a whopping five minutes in the long essay question to do this. Your hardest part is still beginning. If you've seen earlier episodes or not, we'll do some pre-writing as a review. You want to see an exemplar of this again. That was the understanding we got from feedback. So let's show you a little four by four relay and 411 converting into skeleton. You can still do this. Time still beckons for you to do this with one other partner or with three other classmates on a one to lead you to two, lead you to four model of pooling your resources and knowledge. Four by four relay, pick any question you want. It doesn't matter. Your focus is gonna be on outside information. Where are you gonna find that information? AP Classroom. Uh, your text, your notes, uh, the, the things you've done in class all year long. You, it's all in the filing cabinet of your mind. You just want to have the top drawer open, your hand ready to pull that file when the time comes. That's what you're shooting for. So what's the procedure? Take that question, spill your brains on the page for a minute. What can you think of? Persons, books, laws, facts, treaties, events, battles, proper nouns, the kind of stuff that you're going to use the information you can elaborate on. Pair up with your partner, share those lists, grow, those, grow that list a little bit as well. Don't just pull it, but keep trying to pull more out of each other. And then if you have two other classmates that, that might be doing this as a group of four, turn those two pairs into a quad and keep doing that same thing. At the end, you might have something like this. And again, from last time, don't say, I quit, I'm leaving, I can't do this. This is actually a deliberately unwritable question. This is an example of one I've used in my own class where we're never going to write this. We're actually not going to try to 401 it. But my goal here is to get my students cross period to see what it is they know in a proper noun sense they can pull out of each other. And also with us getting into period seven and period eight and period nine, we're getting closer to things you've done. We're not talking about content that you were covering back in August anymore. There ought to be a little more there there. So this is actually two questions I married together so that we could get my students to talk about before and after each war, just what did they kind of know about it? And remember, you don't need all this by any stretch. Six to nine, you know, six to 10 proper nouns adequately used will lights out if you develop them, not just stretch your paper, but give you an awful lot of evidence to make a really decent case. But you gotta make the case. Evidence is only as good as the, as the argument allows it to be. If you're not doing that stuff in the red down there, if you're not showing, justifying, proving, more is not always better. Sometimes it's just more. So how are we going to get a lot out of a little? Well, you should have a general list of information like mine. If you can do two to three of these per time period, like say one in the progressive era, one in imperialism, one in World War I, you'll have covered, uh, or one in the Roaring Twenties, you'll have covered a whole lot of period 7A. Uh, messing around with those things in a five-minute, 15-minute period of time, you've got a lot to work there. And then create your thesis and context paragraph, your 411, based on how we talked about it in episode two. And finish up by writing your first full sentence of every body paragraph with a bullet point list of information that you would put in there. That would give you your skeleton, which is what you're shooting for in many ways. So let's see what an example looks like in application. I showed you a little 401 cheat sheet on a non-question. Let's use a real AP prompt now. This is an honest to goodness AP US history prompt uh, from the national exam taken from AP classroom. It's a DBQ prompt. 
But for our purposes, it doesn't matter. We're using this to coach ourselves up, to brush ourselves up on that evidence that we know we'd have to bring in, whether it's an LEQ or a DBQ. So let's just pretend the documents aren't there. Evaluate the relative importance of the different causes, plural, for the expanding role of the United States in the world from between eight, uh, from 18th world power from 1865 to 1910. My four by four information in no particular random order looks like so. Some of this you've seen from what we did already. Some I just didn't have time to get to because we're in a 45 minute and I'm cheat, I'll cheat again. I'm gonna go 50, maybe 53 if the college board doesn't strike me down with lightning. But we're gonna try to do a little longer so I can slow it down. I hope I'm not too fast and still deliver what you need on the content wing and on the process wing. So six D's, six P's, where are they? Scroll back up and find it when you look at home to watch this again. Annexation of Hawaii, Alaska, our turn of thesis argument, missionary work or white man's burden as they saw it during the time from the Kipling phrase, uh, Spanish American war, Platt and Teller amendments, Alfred Thayer Mahan's book, The Influence of Sea Power on History, which changed people's minds, arguing for the need uh, the, of the United States to have island bases as power projection points for our navies around the world. Josiah Strong's Our Country, making a very nationalistic, almost Darwinistic argument, case for imperialism. John Hay, author of The Open Door Policy, uh, Great White Fleet. Um, Taft and dollar diplomacy using the juicy carrot of American funding and dollars to get Caribbean and South American nations to kind of do what we like. And Wilson with moral diplomacy. I will teach them to elect good men, as he uh, famously said, trying to create democracy in the American model in those places and spheres of influence. So a whole, a whole lot of outside information here. First things first, your question asked you to evaluate. All right. What's that mean? In real English, Evaluation, it's to weigh, to judge, or determine. See, I want you, because you're my kids now, just like my kids at school, I want you to be like bilingual. I want you to be able to speak, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old talk. And I also want you to be able to speak fluently in the College Board's language. That includes understanding and knowing a lot about, as we'd said, the curriculum framework itself. What is the wording and phraseology from which questions come? But also, what are your action words in real English? If you don't know what it is you're supposed to be doing, in marching along, you're gonna have a hard time doing it. And then, um, so again, like we've always said, you've got to walk before you can run, you've got to crawl before you can walk. We're in that crawling phase to lead you up to that running phase. Based upon the question asked, you have several causes. That's implicit. You've got to differentiate between their relative importance. You've got to weigh, judge, or determine the relative importance of these numerous causes for our prompt, all right? So your thesis, your answer to the question, in real English is this, your position on or response to this question about judging or weighing the varying degrees of importance of some of these numerous factors that led to expansion, imperial, imperial oversight in the world. Contextualization, as I've told you before, is this how we got to here moment. It's the backstory out of which this question, the historical broth out of which this question sprung forth. And so you will always have context up front, but remember you have to have a thesis first. If you don't have a position, you can't, you can't background something if you don't have something to background. You're putting your cart ahead of your horse there. So basic model, four background sentences, one sentence for your thesis, one sentence for how your essays are organized. Now, a question you asked in our Google, our Google uh, live stream chat was, can I just have one sentence at the bottom that has my plan of attack and my thesis in it? Yes, yes, yes. Remember, I'm showing you strategies and they are not completely you must do it this way. That, that's, that's not it at all. Um, you could argue that the one and the one sentence together actually are your thesis. So you could go for one. That's fine and good. This is just a, a general boilerplate plate way to go about it if you're sort of stuck and wondering how, to, uh, how you're going to go about it. So starting with four background sentences, one sentence staying your thesis, one sentence your plan of attack, give yourself five to eight minutes to practice doing this. So let's establish our position. Let's start with my thesis. So cheat and cruise down the page a little. Let's look down there at the first number one. Although the United States did desire to expand its role in the world because it felt a duty to civilized nations and act as a global problem solver, kind of conceding, here's the payoff. The most important reasons for America expanding its role in the world came from a growing need to protect American economic interests abroad. Plan of attack, this can be seen through European competition with Europe for global influence, desire to expand its economy with trade, and the ideal manifest destiny. So that's my position. What's our background? Go up at the top. And notice the red part there, all those red words up there, if that's outside information that delivers the goods for you in terms of bringing you to real, you know, real sort of uh, 
outside information that proves you can establish context and might maybe, maybe give you enough to separate one piece out to be outside information for your evidence point. Maybe. But at minimum, you are definitely, you know, it's nailed down for sure. You're getting two points right now out of the gate with these six sentences. What's our background? The late 19th century saw the United States undergo a period of economic growth. The era of growth following the Civil War was a story of northern industrialization and southern reconstruction attempts to rebuild a shattered economy and society. At the same time, fulfilling manifest destiny by, bang, closing the frontier, the expansion that started before the Louisiana Purchase and the War for Texas fueled our desire to expand elsewhere. So we're setting the table for how we got to here. As we looked outward, we often, the United States often disguised this desire to build an empire through the moral need to spread democracy and American values. Then you're on to your thesis. By the way, you want to know how good things had to be. I didn't write this one. This is an actual student example. It's a composite of a couple of different student examples. This is real adolescent work. So I wanted to show you that it's not just, you know, oh, smart guy teacher man's writing those big fancy paragraphs. You can do these things. If these kids can do, these kids put their hands on leg, one leg at a time, just like you, um, you can do these things as well if you kind of know how to set some, up, some things up and structure yourselves. So your skeleton follow-up. What was our first point here? It was um, competition with Europe over global influence. First body paragraph. Although coming late to global imperialism, the U.S. did establish dominance in the Caribbean, even as it tried to reduce spheres of influence elsewhere. Here's my outside information I drop in, influence the department history, those spheres, and I would elaborate upon these things, obviously, in there. I don't just drop them in and run, run away. Second paragraph, or second paragraph was what? Uh, expanding trade opportunities. Expansion of potential for trade that came with it was seen by imperialists as being critical to the growth of the U.S., getting to our business cycle, Hawaii and uh, places like, you know, Dole Company and United Fruit Companies and their actions in South and Central America or Central America rather than Hawaii, open door policy for trade options. And the Panama Canal is not just a strategic, but a commercially valuable property in terms of generating uh, a lot of commerce and business and trade. Lastly, Manifest Destiny's American Ideal had practicality and use beyond the continent. That's the, state, the setup for my final paragraph. I'll elaborate on Turner thesis and how Darwinism would expand that beyond our borders and get into Josiah Strong in our country and his deeply nationalistic arguments for why Americans had this as their duty they needed to do. That's great, you got your evidence. But as you said, for complexity and also elaboration, what are you gonna do with it? You've got to be able to, you must be able to tell us what this evidence shows, demonstrates, illustrates, proves, or explains. If you simply had that list like I had, more is always better. It's just more. You've done nothing with it, which gets you no love. Never include evidence without immediately following it up with a sentence or two that uses one of these verbs. So here's an exemplar. Although coming late to global imperialism, remember our body paragraph sentence, the U.S. did attempt to establish dominance in the Caribbean, even as it tried to do spheres elsewhere. For instance, here's my fact. When the U.S. went to war with Spain, it passed the Teller Amendment, bing, indicating that the U.S. had no desires to seize Cuba for itself. However, shortly after freeing Cuba from Spain, the United States passed, bing, the Platt Amendment, which did not allow Cuba to make any agreements without American approval. Okay, great. So what? Always be prepared to answer the question of so what? This shows, here's your payoff. This is how you deliver the goods on evidence with nuance and sophistication. This shows that Americans discovered they had international interests they felt were worth protecting, even if that meant denying other peoples the right to fully rule themselves. In this, the United States proved that it could act and be just as much of an imperial power as the European empires. So you're making your case now on the things that we're doing and why we're doing them. So let's look at an example now of complexity and argumentation. This is that sixth point. So I'm transitioning a little bit, but still talking about argument here. Corroboration, qualification, or modification addressing a prompt. This is that holistic point. And as Dr. Webb talked about the other day, I can't simply point at one sentence or one paragraph and say, there's, your, there's my context. This is the one point that puts all the moving parts and pieces of an essay together, which is a maddening definition for you. I get that. I assure you, it's a maddening definition for your instructors. The colloquially, colloquially nicknamed really good essay point, which does you uh, not a lot of help in terms of that. It's the one rubric point that takes into account the overall sophistication, overarching nature of the work. So to corroborate, if you use enough evidence and reinforce those pieces of evidence to justify a claim in real detail, explaining how those pieces of evidence interlock to make or prove your case, you can make a complex argument. 
I cannot show you this because we would have to read an essay that did this. And as I said, we would read the whole essay. You and I'd be here for 10 to 12 minutes doing that and picking it apart. And we don't have enough time as it is. You know, I got a whole act. I can be here for plenty of stuff, but we don't have time to do that and get where we need to get in 50, 55 minutes. Qualification. The kind of essay where throughout the argument you hedge, you're like, Americans were imperialist, but, or they were not imperialist, but, and kind of move on from there. You're making a concession to some limitations of your overall argument throughout the work with real elaboration or modification to consider and incorporate alternative views or evidence into your essay when that time comes. So let's look at complexity. What could you do for our specific essay on imperialism? You could talk about the different ways the U.S. had a role in the world and the ways that role expanded in detail on trade, on international agreements, the Portsmouth Peace Conference, which ends the Russo-Japanese War. Teddy Roosevelt arbitrated that agreement or mediated that agreement uh, between the Japanese and the Russians, for which he earned a Nobel Peace Prize, showing Americans engaging in an independent role in the world as a third party sort of a peacemaker. Annexation, informal imperialism, all these with major detail and elaboration explaining similarities and differences. What was our style or flavor of expansion, our role in the world in Central America, compared to that expansion flavor of that role in South America, compared in the same essay to the expansion flavor in Asia and or in the Pacific. Doing this with nuance and detail would show the various moving parts of expansion, saying that not all various forms of this are the same or explaining in-depth connections to other time periods, like the efforts to establish international authority through negotiation with the British over Oregon, through manifest destiny and a Texas independence and the war with Mexico, our negotiations with Texas and with Mexico prior to conflict and during and after conflict, or the, the elaboration on the real details that went into Indian removal, whether it was uh, under the Jackson administration or before, before, during, or after that, excuse me. Any of these kinds of things, all into Louisiana, our agreements to purchase that from France. How is that similar or different than the things that we're seeing at the dawn of the 20th century? And really elaborate on those in detail. And here's the kicker. Each of these would involve the analysis of numerous pieces of evidence serving as multiple variables to show that nuance or differentiation interwoven within the essay throughout the essay as part of the theme or argument. I can't show it to you because as I said, we would be Period seven, we'd be 20 minutes just on this alone. Um, complexity, incorporating uh, in qualification. If you incorporated or elaborated upon evidence or argument that shows maybe the limits of our role and power in the world this time. Open door policy, for example, we really never got the free trade opportunities that we sought in Asia, not the degree that we wanted them. Uh, the complications of putting down the, uh, the Philippine insurrection or the uh, Philippine American war that takes place after uh, the United States takes the rule there, brings up a lot of real problems with the Democratic Republic trying to actually engage in, um, in imperial oversight or complexity and qualification. Here's an example actually, again, of real student work. And this is a theme that was elaborated upon throughout this whole essay. These aren't my words, these are adolescent words. Qualifying your argument nuance. The US took many efforts to try to assimilate the Filipinos and have them have the same political and societal views as they did, meaning the Americans. This reflects the ongoing trend of that time of racial superiority, which is synonymous to how the US treated newly freed slaves at home. However, despite the imposing negative shadow the US cast over conquered lands due to our own nationalism, this feeling came from a genuine sense of morality and genuine care for other people. This is the argument the student then would make and elaborate on with detail throughout to qualify their argument. Imperialism came was, you know, not some things not so great, but there were some aspects and attributes of it that came from a sense of something positive. That's the argument they're going to make. You don't have to agree with that argument, but again, that's what a thesis is. It's your position on the question. As a reader, I'm willing to be sold provided you make the sale. This claim without evidence may or may not make the sale. And that's what has to go on throughout the work. Modification. Again, incorporating and elaborating that evidence that would show or prove that limits of the time. Modification is in shifting the position somewhat counter to the question. For instance, arguing that US global expansion was not as pronounced as maybe your textbook, the traditional interpretation, or even the prompt itself implies, taking a uh, sort of countervailing theme. Or you could state or list the relative, instead of stating or listing the relative importance of these causes, you could prove their relative importance of these multiple causes again and again, coming back to evidence and coming back to why you were demonstrating how these other causes are not quite as important as the one I'm talking about for my role in the world. 
Corroboration again, it would involve the analysis, same slide, of numerous pieces of evidence, multiple variables interwoven throughout the essay. So let's review. Back to our content again. Populism. Populists and the progressives, the reform movement that preceded them, are different in some critical ways. And if you're looking for a compare and contrast question, this gives you a great example of something you can compare and contrast. The progressives, unlike the populists before them, were urban-centered in orientation and outlook. They were middle-class Americans. They were Americans who actually had gained some of the benefits and successes of the American dream. As such, they did not want to burn it all down in terms of reform. They were moderate in what they wanted. They saw the system as being not irredeemably broken, but in need of some tuning and repair. As a result, because of this moderation and their middle class, the fact they have access to some levers of influence of power, they do result in several tangible legislative and institutional gains. Uh, they were rationalists, driven by um, research, data, scientific method. And to this point, they were on the inside looking around. They were beneficiaries of the American system. But as they looked around this world, the urban bubble they lived in, they saw things that were not so great. Poverty, class distinction, pollution, um, those going without who shouldn't go without. And so they're on the inside looking around. The populists, their predecessors, were rural in orientation outlook, and they were poor. As such, they had limited access to levers for change. Also as such, because of this fr frustration, the goals they wanted in many ways were seen as far more ambitious or radical. They really wanted to stand parts of the American economic system on its head. Because they wanted so much, they did result, and the result is in a minimal policy gains. And they were angry. We use the term lowercase p populism to reference this ever since. A movement driven by emotion, by a frustration with the status quo that seems to have left them out. They feel they are very much on the outside looking in. There's this Gilded Age Prosperity Party that some have been invited to, but not them. And they don't like it. So progressivism might best be described as a whole series of movements. If you took a paint can, popped the lid off, and flipped it over, and dumped it on the ground, that paint's going to spatter in all kinds of directions. And that's what the progressive movement is. There is no one interlocking movement moving forward boldly as a unified front into the future. What you have is movements in jagged various directions, often with tunnel vision, focused on the thing that they're focused on. For instance, there were advocates for public school expansion, getting more Americans into public education, a standardized system, conservation movements that were focused exclusively on environmental protection, creation of wildlife reserves, national parks, resource management, irrigation and uh, forest, forestation programs, settlement houses, making life more accessible for that transition to the United States for immigrant classes in urban America. Jane Adams, uh, graduate of Rockford College, uh, Rockford uh, in, in Seminary Institute as it was then, is one of the more famous one, uh, textbook examples you see everywhere. National Association for Advancement of Colored People, formed during this time as advancements, struggles for advancements in race relations, along with this first great migration of African Americans out of the South to the urban North takes place as the Jim Crow status of the South cements itself into place during this time. Consumer protection, Pure Food Drug Act, Meat Inspection Act, driven in many ways by Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, moral reform such as banning alcohol, the 18th Amendment, uh, and also women's right to vote with women's suffrage, the 19th Amendment, changes for working, condition, working conditions, child labor's laws, workman's comp, workplace safety, empowering people to make decisions on policy. Initiative, allowing people to propose laws and have those laws voted on on the ballot. Referendum, where the people have a law that's on the ballot, they will vote up or down that legislators are suggesting. Or recall, we vote you in, we don't like you, we vote you out ahead of schedule. Also, city commission and manager movements designed to challenge machine politics and have urban America governed by knowledge and expertise, by qualification, rather than political hacks and patronage and nepotism and connections like that. And of course, corporate regulation in the form of trust busting under Teddy Roosevelt, and later on under Woodrow Wilson, the Federal Trade Commission, and the reestablishment of sort of a central bank for the United States under the Federal Reserve in 1913, which gets the United States back into the central banking system for the first time since Andrew Jackson kills the Bank of the United States in uh, 1836. So let's look at an example in play of progressive content here, bring us into short answer. You'll have three or five short answers. You know this already, I believe. Uh, roughly 13 minutes per question. Digital students have to answer two more additional, and there's no choice. This replaces your long essay. Again, I'll scoot through these slides. I hear the cheering of those of you in the background that have seen them 100 times already. Those of you who haven't seen them, go back and look on your own. Uh, when you view this a second time, it goes through the distinctions and differences on SAQs. This is important to watch again. We I showed it to you last time. Pencil and paper, paper exam takers, mind the rule of the box. 
the outside of this, the outside border will not even be seen by the reader because College Board's DT, ETS's technology for capturing your responses for digital scoring of them only captures the confines of the box itself where the lines are inside. So whatever you're writing must, must fit there. Digital folks, this is worth looking at too. There is no, you've got a box to enter things in, I guess, but it's not a 23 line box. It's simply a portal online. You can write all day long. So it is possible for you to write a short answer that is 5,000 characters and takes you 45 minutes to do it. You're not gonna wanna do that. You're gonna have to watch the clock on your own. So time management for you is really important. And remember, this is not a miniature essay. Here's your directions. Again, a bulleted list is not acceptable. I talked about this for the questions you ask me. You can do A, B, and C, but have sentences when doing it. Let's look at student work because you want to see that. Progressive era cartoon here. What do we have going on in this image? You've got an image here, Theodore Roosevelt. Do thing one, thing two, thing three. Briefly describe one perspective expressed on the role of government society. Briefly explain one event that leads to the situation in the image. And briefly explain one outcome about of the progressive era debates about the role in society. So thing one, thing two, thing three. And here, because I think you wanted it, again, from your feedback, student work. I'm not gonna show you ones I wrote. I'm gonna show you ones that get the point and ones that don't. Because remember, it's three points, point, 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 or no point, no point, no point. Three separate instances of victory or death, victory or death, victory or death. You do it or you don't, you do it or you don't, you do it or you don't. So not a miniature essay, feed the question, give it what it wants specifically, all right? 23 lines, use the rule of nine. If you don't really know how to answer, how to elaborate, uh, John Brokowski, uh, tip of the cap to him out of Miami-Dade uh, area, high schools in that area. Some of you may hear uh, his term referencing this as ACE. Answer the question, cite your evidence, elaborate upon its meaning. I've always sort of referenced this as the uh, rule of nine. One sentence for task A that responds to the question, one sentence providing evidence, and one sentence that explains or elaborates upon that evidence's meaning. Do that three times, three sentences, that's your rule of nine or acing the question. So let's look at good news and bad news. Thing one, describe one perspective expressed by the artist about the role of government in society. Artist is a muckraker, trying to expose scandals and, un and unfairness in the industries. He is making a comment about Theodore Roosevelt and the federal government that has begun to crack down on health codes and legislations to protect people, and elaborate on the meaning of this, the role of the government is coming out of laissez-faire and beginning to make reforms to the country. This earns the point. This is an actual student example on this real prompt from the national exam when this was a real question on it that earns the point. Compare that with this here. The role of the government in society, as shown in this image, is to take away things you don't want the public to know. So we're misinterpreting the image. As depicted in the image, President Roosevelt is raking away the letters spelling out meat and scandal. The role of the government is to make sure the public only know what the government allows. Does not earn the point, misinterprets the piece entirely. Briefly explain how one event or development led to the situation you see in the image. Upton Sinclair wrote the book, The Jungle. A little backstory here, some context, which utilized investigative journalism to expose the dangers of the meat industry to the public, to Americans becoming more informed about the unsafe, unhealthy conditions. Because of this, elaborating on our evidence, it sparked the government to do something about it. This earns the point. Here, during this time, the journalists were called muckrakers. They were the voice for the people. Well, so what? Have we actually tied this to the question at all? What is the, how, there's no elaboration on journalists being called muckrakers and a voice for a people led in any way to the historical situation being developed in the image. So the top one you see, smiley face feeds the question, sad face does not feed the question, no point. Briefly explain one specific outcome, and this gets back to one of the FAQs you asked me at the beginning of the hour, um, debates on the role of government. As a result of these debates, there was more regulation. Pure Food and Drug Act was passed and shod labor laws. Many reforms are made to fix or regulate the industries. That's where we're going, earns the point. Here's your classic example of someone was asking about mistakes, the things being done in a hurry. Clearly here, I said, you can make a mistake and call Franklin Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, unless it appears that you actually think you mean Franklin Roosevelt. And here the student means Franklin Roosevelt. The New Deal is now providing all this help. Oopsies, we are now beyond the time period of when our real question and prompt is. We have misconflated time periods and presidents in particular. So we are not earning the point. We are the wrong person, the wrong time, the wrong place doing the wrong thing. All right. So let's review then back to content for yourselves here as we're about, you know, maybe about 10 minutes to go here. I'm on World War I, the 20s, a few more things to show you. The First World War, origins of American involvement, specifically back to content. 
think about the cause of the War of 1812 as a cross period thing. What got Madison sucked into the War of 1812? Issues with freedom of the seas between warring powers, specifically the French and British, when the United States sought to trade as a neutral third party. What got us sucked into World War I? Issues for the Wilson administration as a neutral third party attempting to trade between belligerent or warring powers being the central powers of, uh, of the, the Ottomans, the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Germans, and the allies of the Italians, the uh, French, and the, and the British, and of course the Belgians and uh, Dutch as well. So you've got unrestricted submarine warfare as both sides. The the allies place a blockade on Europe, and it's very easy for them to do on the continent because England and France on the outside around the English Channel and the North Sea entrance, they can starve out in a world where resources an industrial world, where resources are needed to wage modern wars. The Germans counter with unrestricted submarine warfare. The most famous and egregious instance of this is the sinking of the Lusitania. A whole bunch of you have seen the movie Titanic. It takes three and a half hours for the ship to sink. The movie's about as long as it took for the ship to go down. The Lusitania sinks in 18 minutes. Time it takes you to eat your lunch. 1,100 uh, people drown or die on it, including 124 Americans, about 40 children, I think about 20 or so infants. And so this is seen as an egregiously rogue nation terroristic act. And so the Germans for a while back off on submarine warfare, but ultimately decide American trade with uh, the allies could not be any more benefiting the allies for the war than if the Americans were in the war with them. So ultimately, they decide to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. And along with the Zimmerman note, where the Germans make entreaties to Mexico saying, hey, attack America when we declare war. And when the war is over and our side wins, we'll let you take Texas and California, the whole Southwest back. Which needless to say, when this is exposed to the Americans as the British uncover it, um, this is not well received. And those uh, two twin pillar pillars lead uh, Wilson to declare war. And in his declaration of war, in many ways, this is a true encapsulation of progressive thinking. What could be more progressive than going to a wage war on behalf of humanity to end war forever? It's in many ways the culmination of the whole progressive line of thought on, on the notion of making the world a better place that could be improved upon. So as for war itself, the convoy system uh, allows you allows American vessels to safely be escorted across the ocean in large groups surrounded by naval vessels to defeat the U-boats. The Americans can also build ships faster than the Germans can sink them. The Germans in two world wars are going to attempt to test this thesis of we can sink ships faster than the, the, West can, the Western powers democracies can build them. In both wars, they come within an eyelash of being successful at it, but in both wars, they're not successful. The American Expeditionary Force, the first military unit sent overseas or to engage in your conflict with the Europeans since 1812, the dead hand of George Washington's farewell address governed American foreign policy up until this time, this grand departure. And of course, trench warfare, which was in many ways a harbinger that, that was seen initially uh, the precursors of that in many ways were Lee's defensive campaigns around Petersburg uh, late in the American Civil War, sort of a harbinger of things to come. Consequences, the war is over, the Treaty of Versailles, the 14 points. Wilson has this plan sort of ahead of his time for an international sort of convening body, a governance, not a governance board, but a, a convening forum where nations can work out their problems and issues through dialogue to actually learn the lessons of history. Remember, Wilson himself was a historian. He's to this day is the only American president who had a PhD prior to elective office. President of Princeton University was a was history man. And so he tries to set up a world to undo some of the problems that led to the First World War through having his 14 points of no secret treaties, no colonization, um, uh, self, self-determination for peoples, no, un, no submarine warfare, things like that. Um, this is going to fail as Americans have buyer's remorse after World War I and say, we really maybe should have listened to Washington after all. The Espionage and Sedition Acts, along with the Schenck decision, are part of a longstanding American theme of patriotism for a wartime effort often leads to intolerance of difference at home, because it's not a very far trip from I love America to I love America so much that if you don't love it like I do, you're just not a good American. And intolerance becomes the, uh, the unexpected child, if you will, the unexpected baby that is born out of this warfare whipping up a patriotic uh, of feelings, which is going to lead to a fear of the other culminating in immigration restriction, everything old is new again, culminating in immigration restriction and rollbacks of organized labor, a fear of communism and the Palmer raids, which were a suspension of civil liberties in the post-war era for radicals and dissidents, which leads us to the 1920s. What makes the modern era modern? In many of your textbooks, the 20s are called the modern era. 
Well, thing one is like the world we live in today, an increasingly urban centered world. Mass quantities of standardized consumer goods available for everyone. That starts in this age. The, the packaging, the style, the goods may change, but the world we live in today in many ways is still this same world, which is why this is considered the, uh, modernism. <laughs> Think about your own times, the worship of technology, right? We all love the latest cell phone when it comes out. Can't wait, right? The latest, uh, latest uh, Xbox, latest game we're going to get. Worship of technology is the idea that machines every day make our lives better in every way. This begins with the 1920s. Mass media, a homogenized entertainment, uh, advertising, a shared common national culture that's accessible to be shared. Think of your own social media and how you know, we can have films come out on the internet, movies come out on the internet, songs come out on the internet. Radio does this during this time, as well as the motion picture industry for its age. Communication, transportation, tying together these national countries and national markets. And as for politics and culture, the aforementioned nativism leads to a number of restrictive immigration quota acts designed to restrict immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe and, uh, and Asia in particular. It's the era when the Klan goes national. The Klan expands into more than an anti-Black uh, organization. It becomes an agency that is not just uh, anti-Black, but also anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, anti-Jew, anti-immigrant, I'm sorry, uh, anti-intellectual rather, anti-Southern and Eastern European immigration in the name of the cause of preserving white Protestant Anglo-Saxon Americanism as they saw it. It's a divide between urban and rural that takes place in this nation, along with religious fundamentalism culminating in the Scopes Monkey Trial, whereby you see creationism clash with evolutionary theory in terms of what is the, um, what's the natural order of things in terms of education and American culture. The Jazz Age, the 1920s, this era of this flowering and blossoming of culture, the lost generation authors, which you might have read about in your American lit classes, such as Gatsby, um, Sinclair Lewis, the subset of that being the Harlem Renaissance, the outpouring of African-American creative uh, arts and energies through a form of things like Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred, uh, the notion of the jazz age and jazz being African-American music uh, coming out of this time for a national audience and the flapper culture representing new freedoms uh, for women as well. So looking at an exemplar to try to bring you back to so many things you want, um, press for time, but we will make this happen one way or another, uh, or we're gonna die trying, but we're gonna make it happen. The 1920s has been characterized as a decade of economic, social, and political change. Analyze the extent to which the First World War and consumerism drove this change. Again, documents, we'll skip them. Four by four relay for a question like that. What would I drop into this question on uh, economic, social, and political change? World War I impacts, a whole bunch of things I laid out. The Committee on Public Information, which was designed to generate patriotism for the war effort. Nativism, national origins, all the items I just sort of talked about here. Consumerism, Raiders and movies, homogenized entertainment, prohibition, the Model T Ford is an example of automobile and moving technology, monkey trials, uh, Scopes monkey trial, that modernist versus fundamentalist divide, mass production of goods, the notion of advertising turning the things we want into things that believe, we believe we must need and consumerism, we can't live without them. All right. So you've got to use that evidence in your paper. Remember to do these things. All the stuff that I just showed you in four by four, it's only good if you can use it to show, demonstrate, illustrate, prove, or explain. So you can go three for three on exemplars tonight. So immediately follow it up here. What's an example of following it up? One of the major impacts of the First World War on American society was the degree of intolerance and fears it generated of foreign peoples and foreign ideas in general. Here's our fact now. The anti-German feelings encouraged by the Committee of Public Information for the war effort bred a type of patriotism that by the 1920s quickly morphed into an oppressive, anti-immigrant, anti-radical, only one way to be an American sort of ethos. To elaborate on this now. So I've said what the fact is, well, so what? This is clearly demonstrated. I'm showing what evidence means for the question. In the Red Scare fear of communists, which peaked with the Palmer raids, where persons were arrested more for who they were and what they believed than whether or not they had done anything wrong. Similarly, the National Origins Act of 1924, another fact in there, which restricted immigration from anywhere that was not Northern or Western Europe, shows we're delivering the goods we're showing we're not telling what we're showing how we're showing how these native spheres of the other were converted into government policies designed to keep the united states society of the 1920s as white as anglo-saxon and as protestant as possible all of which had a great effect on american society bringing us back to the question this is what you need to do with your evidence to elaborate and explain consistently which can begin to demonstrate writ large complexity for you as well as uh 
argumentation. So what should we take away? Whew, we had a long way to go and a short time to get there. We got it. I'm still on the clock at 54 minutes, so the college board is not going to haul me out of here in handcuffs. Content essentials for period 7A. We got to that first half. There's a whole lot. There's a whole lot more coming to period 7B. Great Depression, New Deal, World War, recovery, all those things. We overviewed SAQ image-based questions. Organizational pre-writing. Again, you wanted it. You asked, so you received. Four by four, four and one, a skeleton exemplar. One for me, two from, that I set up from the kids. How to compile and use outside evidence. What are you going to do for complexity? What are your rules for evidence to make your evidence work for you so that you are making that sale? Like I said, I'm willing to be sold. You got to make the sale on why your argument is the right one. Your evidence will do that. How to generate your complexity. Tomorrow, Dr. Webb seals the deal on period seven with uh, period 7B, 1929 to 1945, as we before mentioned. Please give us the feedback. We got two episodes to go. We're trying to bring it home for you here with all the goodies that you need. Uh, give us your feedback, good, bad, and different either way. And remember, it can be done. It can be done, and you're going to do it. I'm Bill Pulaski from the friendly confines of Northern Illinois, from Stillman Valley High School in Stillman Valley, Illinois. Brief shout out to uh, Glenbrook South High School in uh, Glenview, Illinois. You know why, if you're wondering. And also a brief shout out to uh, Cambridge High School in Cambridge, Ohio. And so along with those today, uh, those people asking, uh, thank you so much for watching. We're so glad to have had you here. And we look forward to seeing you the next time around. Thank you so much. Stay tuned.